there certainly has been in the past. Right? That was the notorious feature, or one of them, of the, of the Lochner era, that the court thought and right, acted as though there were strong constitutional bars to various kinds of redistributive measures. And one of the things that's interesting about the present is like the Great Depression, like the first Gilded Age, and like many other moments going back deep into the nation's past, there have been recurrently moments when people become painfully aware of growing inequality. And each of those moments saw people making claims on the Constitution, on both sides. People saying what your question suggested, that the Constitution puts some real bars on redistribution, that, there, that ours is an anti-redistributive Constitution, to use a you know, two-penny two word. Um, on the other side, and this is what's different from today, because today we hear those voices again, that ours is a constitution that puts limits on redistribution, right? And we see the court beginning to rekindle the Lochner Constitution in many different places, the, in many important areas, the Obamacare area, right? The campaign finance regulation area, and most recently, in the context of unions and union shops, all over the place, the conservatives are rekindling that kind of economic constitution. What's missing from today's conversation that was vivid in each of those past moments were constitutional voices on the other side, saying not only does our constitution allow, let's say, the Medicaid expansion of Obamacare, not only does our Constitution allow various forms of campaign finance regulation that the court has struck down, or allow right, unions to collect right, fees in lieu of dues, there were voices saying our Constitution actually requires a measure of broad distribution. And that right, is to, to our ears today, whatever our politics, a flabbergasting notion. We have told ourselves a story that the New Deal settlement, the New Deal revolution, was a moment when right, the nation finally said to the courts, enough, get out of the business of right, second-guessing Congress's economic regulations. There are no preferred judicially safeguarded economic liberties and enough. Right? And so we've come to think that the Constitution doesn't speak to these distributive issues, we liberals. That's very different from our past. And the book I'm working on with Joey Fishkin and articles that he and I have written and what I talked about this morning is that it may be time to revisit what I sometimes call the distributive constitution, what Joey and I are calling the constitution of opportunity. And the, the gist of the idea, to illustrate it right, with an example that many folks are familiar with, is something like Jackson's bank veto. When Andrew Jackson vetoed the second bank of the United States, he said, this measure, this law that Congress had enacted to right, re-up the bank violates equal protection. What did he mean, right? First of all, there was no equal protection clause in the Constitution back then since it was before the Civil War. And second of all, even if there were, we don't think of equal protection in terms of economic equality. We think of it in terms of race, gender, and other kinds of what we call now discrete mints or minorities or in any event, minority rights. Jackson's equal protection, equal protection before the equal protection clause, equal protection in the state constitutions where the idea already appeared, was about rich and poor, was about the idea that lawmakers 
couldn't constitutionally enact measures that privileged an economic elite that used law to entrench their power, and that for two reasons. And this is the heart of what I see as this long tradition of constitutional thought and action. The Constitution needs safeguards against oligarchy. Ours is an anti-oligarchy constitution. And second, the promise of equality, what does it mean? Well, to Jackson and for this tradition, it meant that everyone who works hard enjoys equal rights. And what that means concretely is a real genuine chance to belong to the middle class. So there are two propositions, neither of which sound remotely constitutional today. Today, when progressives and liberals think about economic issues and the Constitution, we say, well, we wish and we tried right, to get right, a measure of constitutional protection for the very poor. We tried in the sort of salad days of the 1960s and 70s and the Warren and Burger Court eras to make right, poverty a suspect classification. We focused on the very poor. Right? And in that time of rising prosperity and a broad middle class in which it was the racialized poor who were excluded, it made a lot of sense. And we'd by then forgotten this older tradition. That's not today's America. Today's America right, is, right, or at least we liberals and progressives, are worried about the very poor, but also about the, what, it, what it portends for our constitutional order that the middle class is shrinking. What we're trying to recover is a sense that these two different kinds of worries, the worry that fair equality of opportunity is vanishing, and the worry that there's emerging a kind of entrenched ruling class were once seen as right, entwined worries, as worries that ran through both our commitments to fairness in economic life and our commitment to democracy in political life. And what's surprising when you go back is that Jackson's bank veto is simply one classic text of a long tradition of economic thought that ran to these Right? Concerns about the links between our economic structure and our political structure, our economic life and our political life. And it's going to be a big task, but I think it's the coming task, right? If, if past is prologue, then when the nation is sufficiently roiled about economic inequality, it becomes a constitutional issue. Mm -hmm. Antitrust, banking, the currency, trade, all were talked about on all sides as constitutional questions back in the day. And it's my strong hunch they will be over the next generation once more. Well, the General Welfare Clause was one of Roosevelt's favorite touchstones, as I'm sure you know, when he went on the hustings trying to defend Right? Congress's authority right, to enact robust economic regulations. So when Social Security had not yet been constitutionally secured, when the Wagner Act, the Labor Relations Act, was under constitutional fire, um, when he was right, talking about a right to a decent wage and Congress's authority to enact right, fair labor standards, he frequently recurred both to his vision of an economic bill of rights, but also to the idea of a constitutional authority to act for the general welfare. It turns out that that notion, right, not surprisingly since Roosevelt was tapping into traditions, that notion had a long history. Um, all through the 19th century, we're, congressmen were in the habit of saying, we're not just constrained by the Constitution, we're also impelled to act by the Constitution. It's quite striking. It's, it's, a, it's a 
way of understanding the relationship between the Constitution and lawmaking that's sort of thin today, but was thick back then, that when lawmakers were challenging or right, being challenged for passing various kinds of measures that they claimed were in the general interest, right? um, they wouldn't simply say, we, we have the power to do this. They'd say we'd violate our trust, right? That we are not merely authorized, but obliged to enact this or that form of distributive measure, right? Whether it was disaster relief, right? an early form of social spending, or whether it was, for example, a sort of piece of a piece of legislation which probably many of us today, even those of us on the left, may have may think of as simply naked protectionism, you have one of the great progressives in Congress, La Follette, saying we need to outlaw oleomargarine in order to save the Wisconsin dairy farmers. Which he said, we can use the tax power for the general welfare, just as we must spend in the general welfare. And we'd be derelict if we didn't. And he reached back. This was a day when all these arguments about what Congress can and can't do, what it should or shouldn't do, what it must do, right, were shot through with constitutional right, mm -hmm. arguments. And so La Follette reached back to an uh, antebellum report on manufacturers in which John Quincy Adams is justifying various tariffs, all in the service, and this is where we get to um, the use of the general welfare clause and the idea of a constitution that doesn't merely allow, but actually right, calls on Congress to, to spread the wealth. Right? All these characters were saying, we're obliged to right, promote right, the broad economic well-being of the country. Right? And measures that can be shown to privilege a few, right? they are either vulnerable in court or at the very least, right, stand condemned by this, what Joey and I call a constitutional political economy. So the, the takeaway is that right, we can't think about the Constitution and the economy only in terms of the courts. We also have to think about the ways in which right, we simply, right, but the way in which these older generations were right, that you can't have, you can't keep a constitutional democracy or a republican form of government, right, with boundless inequality. You can't, right, keep it without a broad middle class. You can't keep it alongside an oligarchic, entrenched economic elite. Right? And that we need to remember and get into the conversation with the right that these kinds of issues have deep constitutional meaning. And, are, and this is, uh, I'll wrap it up because you've yeah. given me a lot of, but are we getting to that point where we're gonna have this kind of discussion? I mean. Oh, I'm sure we are. I really am confident. We, every time there's been, I think this generation that's experienced the crash you know, the, the Great Recession, and that sees, right, the question of decent opportunity, decent incomes, you know, as, as an urgent one, um, we'll make sure we, we do. Today, the Constitution isn't a significant impediment to social movements, right, that want to um, re-raise poverty amidst, you know, a, in a wealthy nation. There's no question that the, the, but by the same token, those kinds of, whatever the form those arguments will take over the next couple decades, just as with on the right, they'll emerge first arguments about either rights or structural arguments about government's obligations to the poor or government's obligations to end poverty, they'll come out of social movements
they will come in the form of rights claims and structural arguments that everyone will think are utterly off the wall, and they will find their way, right, with luck, into the courts, and will resonate with lower court judges, and, and, but in the first instance, probably will resonate in legislatures. So that the Constitution, let's not kid ourselves, isn't, right, a sort of tool to take to court to lick poverty, but it is a resource in, in that struggle. 